We're on. <laughs> Let's do that. Hello, hello. This is Dr. Shakib. I'm with Kimberly Good. Collins. Kimberly is a postpartum doula, which she's going to explain to us what that means for those of you who are watching this video and you're not familiar with the term doula. And um, some of the questions that have to do with uh, new moms, maybe not so new moms, but new challenges. You know, those of us who are mothers, we all know every baby's different. Yes, absolutely. And uh, so with that said, let's, uh, Kimberly, tell us more about yourself. How, what got you interested in being a postpartum mm -hmm. versus before? I mean, I, I was yes. only familiar with doulas that go in the room with the moms. That's the thing with the, Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So tell us about so, it. So um, I was a nanny privately for high profile families for the last 10 years. And I wanted a switch because I didn't feel as appreciated in that job field. And so I was looking for something else where I could be appreciated but still feel fulfilled working with children and babies is, I just love them. I love them. It totally <laughs> fills me up. So I loved, I was talking with my good friend Kim and she told me about her career path of switching um, and becoming a postpartum doula and I contacted a company and I did all of the certification and requirements and I transitioned over to becoming a postpartum doula about a year and a half ago. That's fantastic. Yes. So um, tell us what that means. For one, doula, what, what kind of word is that? <laughs> it sounds very Middle Eastern to it does. me. <laughs> I know. I have people who are like, you're what? Wait, so like, wait, postpartum, that means after. What do you do with the baby? <laughs> <laughs> I'll help mommy. I'm like, hold on a second. <laughs> so I am basically your guru for everything after your baby is here. The minute they're here, I will help you with nipple confusion and breastfeeding and sleep training and everything newborn baby. I'll help you with the newest products on the market and what would suit your needs best, help adjust bottles if necessary, pumps. I do everything for mom and baby. Well, one thing that I have to say um, I appreciated about Kimberly is that um, I'm always under the impression, and being a chiropractor that I am, I really am pro-natural ways of doing things. And the two of us were talking about, I can't remember what we were breastfeeding. talking about. Breastfeeding. And oh, that's right. Being given a bottle. That's right. So the, the question for Kimberly was, um, what's the situation with nipple confusion, given that, you know, a newborn baby is all, you know, into, and nursing and then if a new mom for one reason or another decides to give a bottle to the baby if that causes any issues my stand was absolutely you don't want to do it mm -hmm. in fact that was my policy uh, with my own child and then um, I was actually very impressed at how open you were to other options mm -hmm. so good thing I'm not a doula and Kimberly is <laughs> in, my, in my situation, it would have been just bear the pain and do it. <laughs> and yeah. you, I appreciated that you were so open-minded and you did entertain the different options and uh, it seemed you were very comfortable with the alternatives to just natural nursing. Yes. <laughs> I do want to look at the big picture of what is healthiest, my body and soul, for mom and baby. Because baby will grow and thrive if baby is getting the breast milk or formula that the baby needs. But we also have to think about the mother and what's best for the mother. And sometimes breastfeeding can be very overwhelming and it can take a toll because the mom knows that they are the sole provider for every single meal for that baby. And there's no break for mom from nursing. That's so and true. Especially in the beginning when babies are learning how to latch and they're making your nipples raw from trying to figure out how to suck and swallow. It gets hard. It gets hard for our moms. It takes a mental toll. And so I'm looking at the mental side of is this beneficial or not? Like if we pump and we introduce a bottle and dad or grandma or a sibling can give a bottle to baby and give mom a break, 
that's actually really beneficial for mom to recharge and continue on wanting to breastfeed. And that's then mom is not <coughs> feeling like she's almost stuck. I have heard that word a lot from my mom. Or feeling like a nursing cow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know I did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that mom doesn't have to be with baby every two to three hours constantly. Like mom can go like get a massage or go to the chiropractor Bingo. or go get her nails done and recharge mentally and emotionally to be the best mom she can be. And so I don't believe in nipple confusion. I believe that if you're introducing both consistently, that baby will learn to do both great. Oh, that's, that's, that, I'm sure that's very, um, um, comforting yes. for moms who feel trapped. I know I did and I didn't want to not nurse, so I didn't want to chance it. So mm -hmm. had I known about a doula, I mean, th this is like a wonderful thing. One thing that I appreciate, and it's kind of fun to see in the office, I see patients with, uh, you know, different range and different groups of people. But one thing was <laughs> I had a patient that I guess she learned you were a doula and she has a nine month old and mm -hmm. she was asking me when you were coming to the office <laughs> so she could ask her question. So then that brings me to the next subject, okay. which is um, being a postpartum doula doesn't have to necessarily mean uh, nursing. nursing. No. Right. So I know that her question had to do with sleeping at night. Should I let the baby cry? Should I not? Mm -hmm. Should I be the only one that attends to the baby versus uh, mm -hmm. is it okay for my husband to go? Mm -hmm. And those, so some of the questions, perhaps this is a good opportunity to, to answer some of the commonly asked questions that you receive from people. Mm -hmm. And then if need be, unfortunately I wasn't able to uh, post the announcement beforehand mm -hmm. to get a bunch of questions lined up. So mm -hmm. if you don't mind uh, asking some of the, or answering some of the questions that you commonly asked, that would be great. Yeah, um, I'm asked a lot. I have different expectations from every parent. Like, when is my baby going to sleep the night? Can you give me a date? And no, I can't. I can't <laughs> give you a date. I can't predict the future. Every baby is a little different. I've had babies sleep six-hour stretches, one month old. And I have four-month-old twins right now who sleep three-hour stretches, and that's what they do right now. But they're thriving in every other category of life, and it does not, it's not necessary to sleep long stretches. We usually start seeing babies sleeping through the night about six months, but sleeping through the night is about eight hours, not the entire 12 hour stretch. We don't expect that right off the bat because they still do need that calorie intake um, to be able to grow and thrive. But I do get a lot of questions of when will my baby sleep through the night? Now, do you think that it's okay to let the baby cry when it's time? <clears throat> I mean, I always thought if you're feeding the baby food, mm -hmm. um, then the baby should be able to sleep through the night if it's a I mean solid food I'm not a big advocate on solid food too early right I know a lot of our pediatricians oh, have the either. mindset of we really only need milk the first year of life breast milk or formula for the first year of life oh wow. at six months when we start introducing cereal it's for practice it's for them to practice having a more thicker consistency and learning how to swallow but it's all for fun and practice there's oh. no nutritional benefit that they, they need those calories from their milk for the first year of life. I and so it's supposed to really just be for practice. But I have a lot of parents who'll be like, well, if I put rice cereal in their milk and they make it heavier, will I get them to sleep longer? And the answer is no, because what you're doing is stretching their stomach and making their stomach bigger to take bigger amounts. Oh. But then they wake up hungrier than they would have without the rice cereal. And I don't see much of a difference, to be quite honest. Okay. in the stretches of hours of sleep going without waking. So there goes another thing I did <laughs> wrong because I thought, um, actually I think my girls were six months old when I started them on, um, not necessarily rice cereal, but um, we did our own thing. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe mashed um, bananas with mm -hmm. like mashed other bananas, things. Avocado. Uh, and I fed them that way. And then at night I would feed them that and then milk thinking they can sleep through the night. <laughs> and I figured, you know, if they have quite a few teeth, and by age one, I think they have at least four. I have some babies who <laughs> are 14 months and don't have a single tooth yet. 
Oh wow, everybody's teeth come in a little differently and they fall out in the same order um, that they come in. Oh, I have no idea mm -hmm. about that. So there. Wow, <laughs> so usually you get your first info. bottom two teeth and then you get your bottom two teeth and then you start filling in. Uh huh. So that's how you lose them also. And you get your two year molars last. Now what do you have, what kind of recommendation do you have for babies who are teething? Mm -hmm. Any any special um, uh, I don't know if it's a toy, anything. Mm -hmm. I, I know with my girls, I would um, put celery sticks in the freezer mm -hmm. uh, because they couldn't choke on it and bite mm -hmm. it off, but they could kind of shred it and it was yes. cold and it would kind of help them with that. They have little, um, these little things on the market now that are great. They're like little mesh inserts that are attached to a handle and you can clean them and put them to the dishwasher and you can put frozen fruits or vegetables inside for them to kind of nosh on huh. and gum at. Because what you're trying to do is help alleviate the pressure and the pain. And we can't do the teething tablets anymore. Those are discontinued from the market. For oh, the Highland the teething? teething tablets have been discontinued. Why is that? Um, we were having some babies that were having seizures. As from a that? Mm -hmm. And so I would not trust any teething tablets on the market at all. Personally, oh. myself, I would not recommend them to my clients. Oh. But there's a lot of ways naturally you can try to help alleviate some of the pressure and the pain. And then if it's really, really bad, I'm not against giving Tylenol. It, it's really, really affecting them. Well, every once in a while <laughs> is okay. I have, I do see it make a big difference because a lot of the times when they're teething, it ends up being this vicious cycle of they're sleep deprived because when you lay a baby down that's teething, they have more pressure their mouth and it hurts more and then they can't sleep long stretches and sleep that great and then they're not eating that great because of the pressure and the pain and so then they're not then they're not sleeping because they have the pain and they're hungry and their bellies aren't full enough and so it ends up being this vicious cycle so if I do have moms who have a couple of days of really bad like not eating that great and not sleeping that great then I start worrying about their brain development and if they're getting enough calorie intake and then I start weighing like okay is the sleep and the brain development and the calories more important than if they had a dose of Tylenol. No, it's often um, you kind of start to outweigh. Right, right. What is most important? That is true. That is true. Um, I just, I hope that everyone paid attention to all the little things that would be taken into account mm -hmm. and not jump in and give Tylenol. Don't give Tylenol right away. There has to be. There's got. You exhausting all the other options. Exhaust all your other right. options. Right. So do you think mm -hmm. that before teething a uh, teething baby, is it better to kind of elevate them? So yes, you can wedge their crib to help elevate a little bit. You can put a, you can fold up a towel and put it underneath to give it a little bit of a slant so that their head isn't flat. I see. And that can help some. And um, rock and plays are a beautiful thing. I love them. They put your baby at a perfect 45 degree angle if they're having any teething issues under the age of six months, um, because they're not recommended after six months. When we start rolling both ways, we can't be in rock and play, just to put that out there for safety concerns. Um, but those are great to help put them at a 45 degree angle. And it also helps with reflux too, when you oh, have a newborn zero to six months. Uh, one of the things that, that, just just out of curiosity, do you notice more complications or difficulties or challenges with babies that are born naturally without any epidural or obviously C-section versus babies who receive, uh, the moms receive epidural and or C-section. Do you see comp any more challenges? I kind of think I know the answer, but I'm just curious. I mainly work with twins. I work with multiples, twins or triplets. And those, as you know, are all born right. typically by cesarean. That's so true. I wouldn't be a great judge I of that. Now, I, out of curiosity, why just twins or triplets? I love a challenge. I love helping <laughs> brand new families that yeah. are walking in not having a child at all or trying to juggle having a young child and two other brand new babies, and what do I do? I love to come in and rescue those families in a way and help make it all fit and work and function and then go on to the next client. That's that's. I love it's. I, I'm sure they need they and I'm sure they need all the help they can. Yes. Now here's a question I'm always asked. Mm -hmm. Do you think what are your views on babies sleeping with mom and dad? And if so, for what time frame do you think that would be reasonable? And regardless of the answer, why? <laughs> um, I'm okay with co-sleeping if baby is in a bassinet next to the bed. 
under no circumstances do I feel like it is safe to have baby in the bed because I'm very worried about baby suffocating or being rolled on. There's been a lot that has really? happened with that, yes. So the parents actually roll over the baby. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. I didn't I did not know that. It's just not <laughs> it's not safe and we don't want any extra fabrics or blankets next to the baby's face. I see. We want the crib bare <coughs> or the bassinet bare. So once her, they've outgrown the size of a, of a bassinet, mm -hmm. would you recommend a crib in the same room as the... Under the age of six months, if they've outgrown their bassinet, which I have seen many times as possible, mm -hmm. um, then yes, I would put baby still in the same room because it significantly decreases the SIDS risk. I see. There are a lot of things that you can still do to decrease the SIDS risk if you wanted to have baby in their own room and you felt comfortable with that. That's also okay and there's nothing wrong with it. Mm -hmm. But having somebody in the same room with another person helps them not go into too deep of a sleep that they stop breathing. I see. Now, um, as far as um, um, transitioning from sleeping in the bedroom with the parents to sleeping in their bed, in their own bedroom, mm -hmm. um, I suspect that at the beginning it's not as easy. It's a transition. It depends on your baby's personality and kind of what you have done working up to it. Because I try to help my um, clients learn to help their babies to comfort themselves. Versus mom or dad running in and picking up baby every time baby cries. Or offering a pacifier or feeding them. Letting baby kind of fuss a little bit. Not working up to a full cry. But kind of trying to figure out how to put themselves back to sleep. Because that's the key and that's what I tried doing in those first six months that I'm with the family is learning the baby sleep cues, um, having them build a nighttime routine, and then doing the same repetition every time so baby knows and counts on it. Oh, and then those babies put routine. themselves right to sleep. And then when those when those babies do have all of those things prior, when you're transitioning them from being in the same room with mom and dad to their own room, you've already set all those great sleep cues that they are typically very comfortable and it's an easy transition. This, these are all great, great um, advice, I think, for new moms or um, in general. Um, now, how, how could people reach you? Um, I know that you're working on your website. Mm -hmm. Do you, are you okay giving your telephone number yeah. and uh, contact information, which I will put at the bottom once I post this video, I will put it at the bottom. Mm -hmm. And obviously everyone can contact me if uh, you need to connect with Kimberly and you can. But can you provide the telephone number for everyone here? Uh, yeah, my phone number is 949-439-2696. 2696. 2696. Mm -hmm. And um, are your clients primarily in Orange County or do you consult yes. over the telephone with them uh, if they're, you know, let's say in LA or other states for that matter? Um, I can do a phone consultation, that's not a problem. Um, and I'm sure with Skype and everything, it probably yes, is not so. Skype <laughs> and FaceTime and right, all those right. like, beautiful technologies we have now. All right, exactly. All right, well, thank you so much, Kimberly, for your time. Thank you for having and me. And thank you for watching. I'll put this, I'll try to see if I can put it on YouTube. I know YouTube has some restrictions with the number of minutes, so I'll do my very best. But once again, thank you for your time. Thank you for watching. You're and welcome. I'm just going to go around and have to stop this. So. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Bye, everybody.